Uh, speaking of solutions, we have uh, with us now two experts at finding solutions. One uh, is a full professor, is a tenure professor at Columbia Business School, Asaf Zivi, a colleague of mine at the School of Business. Uh, and the other is uh, Sandeep Murthy from Lightbox Ventures in India, uh, both joining to talk about how we crack the conundrum of really making sure that the digital health technologies that we're seeing in the, uh, the wealthiest uh, 20 countries are going to find their way into the lowest resourced 1 billion people in 100 countries. And um, on one side of your screen, you see Professor Zivi, who is an expert in machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, again, at Columbia School of Business. And on the other, you see someone who's out there trying to finance some of these technologies and get them into uh, countries around uh, the world, and particularly in India. Thank you both for joining us uh, this morning, obviously, Eastern Daylight Time, not uh, this morning, uh, India Standard Time. Thank you. Good to be here. Look forward to the conversation. Really appreciate it. No, you're both really busy. And um, Professor Zavi Asaf, let, let's start with you. You know, again, um, you, one of the big discussions at the World Bank, the WHO, USAID, Gates Foundation these days around this development of technology around artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, uh, mostly being driven by some of the, uh, the wealthiest nations uh, around the world. But uh, clearly, at the end of the day, uh, the majority of the world does not reflect uh, the, what the wealthiest uh, countries in the world are needing. Um, tell, give us a little bit of a, a background of your teaching and your research, just to give an audience some context of some of the stuff that you've been working on in this area of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Sure. So uh, thanks again for, for having me. And uh, I'll give a little bit of uh, background. So I'm, um, again, an academic uh, professor at Columbia. My main research areas here are mostly in machine learning, AI, data science. And I dabble a bit also in the healthcare space. I've both been involved in various companies, um, uh, various advisory roles, uh, uh, and also have done due diligence on companies, et cetera. I have a keen interest in that in that general space. And I think sort of in general, when I think about um, about AI in, in healthcare, there are a lot of challenges there, but uh, one of the things that I think the, there's a lot of promise is that uh, it will allow eventually to commoditize various healthcare services, uh, which I think will make them more accessible. So, that will allow also to bridge various inequalities that exist in implementation of, uh, of healthcare solutions. So for example, if we can easily track individuals' health more easily with um, wearables, for example, we don't need very high touch environments like we have in US hospitals, for example, but we can do a lot of, uh, a lot of remote care and, and management, which is much more appropriate for various developing countries uh, uh, et cetera. And it's really all the, the key to unlock that is relatively cheap hardware and hopefully supporting software that will be commoditized by, by that point. And there's a lot of activity also in various startups that are trying to, to work in that space to exactly target that, that niche because below the, the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, which is let's say the developed countries where again, the healthcare expenditures are huge. There's a really big chunk of ice where I think this can help unlock a lot of value for, for individuals, for, for governments, um, et cetera. And, and I think one of the challenges that we see there also, a lot of the healthcare, a lot of the AI development in that space is done in uh, Western countries. And I think there's been a lot of discussion, for example, on bias, fairness, et cetera. And I think one of the things that we're gonna have difficulties with is again, translating over a lot of that um, development, because again, there are a lot of biases to the environment where those technologies have been developed. And that I see is, is certainly one of the challenges. There's a translational uh, challenge here before we see more activity that actually emerges in those, in those markets. And, and to that same, in, in that same vein, if you could, Sandeep, just to give us an idea of, of what, your, what, what Lightbox does a little bit, and then really more importantly, how Lightbox is helping to engender this uh, type of digital transformation in India to help not just the, the wealthiest, but also uh, the, the lowest income and lowest resourced. Sure. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm excited to actually hear what Asif has to say here, because I think that's the key. And uh, 
So I've already gotten value out of the uh, evening of being here, and uh, hopefully we'll connect later and learn more about that. Uh, I, I, I do agree that, I mean, there's the, the, so actually I'll take a step back. So we invest in consumer tech businesses. I've been doing this here since 2005. Um, I would say whether it's age or watching your kids get older, you suddenly start to become more aware of the world around you. And you realize that, okay, we got to do something about this. And our more recent focus as a fund um, is to, to make sure we're on the right side of ESG issues. So whether that's environment, social, and, and ensuring that the businesses that we invest in are doing their part to leave the world a better place. So we're not an impact fund, we're not a green fund, but at the same time, I don't believe that those things are mutually exclusive ideas. And I think that if we're gonna solve these problems, you have to find economically viable solutions to them. Now, all that, becomes very relevant in India because you have a population that's coming into consumption. You have a base of people that are now getting exposed because of internet penetration growing to all sorts of ideas. Now, how you define that consumption going forward is really in the hands of the entrepreneurs that are now building business. And I think with that, you start to think about health and you start to think about that as a, as a category. And you realize if I look to the West, it's not clear that the West has solved it in an effective way. I think the healthcare systems you look at 30 years, in the last 30 years, the costs of education and healthcare have continued to rise in the West, even though it's two of the segments that are most supported by government funding. And meanwhile, a lot of the other areas that don't have government funding seem to be doing relatively well at reducing costs and getting services out to people. So I think it's actually pretty compelling, or unfortunately compelling, it's reality in India, that the government money that goes into businesses uh, in the healthcare space isn't significant. And so that leaves us open to a market to define it. And as a fund, we've invested in, in two businesses that are very squarely in the health space. One is in a mental health business. And here again, if you just look at it, and, and actually to answer another point of why this is relevant, 75% of the population in India lives in rural areas, yet only 25% of the health infrastructure is available in those areas. So we are going to have to be reliant on innovative new approaches to actually addressing their needs, whether it's mental or actual health. And so now you have a chance to kind of start from scratch. And, and the opportunity in India overall is a lack of incumbency. And that means a lack of incumbency in the health space as well. I think when you have large companies in any industry, it becomes very hard. You have to not only combat change of customer behavior, but you have to combat the existing businesses and their desires to have to make the world operate in a model that suits them. And so I would say that uh, what, what's exciting and what's interesting to me is that we have entrepreneurs who are looking and thinking about this, you have a market that has a need for it, where we have one of the worst patient to doctor ratios in the world. So clearly, you're not going to add enough doctors fast enough to, to solve the problem. So we have to find these solutions, which as, as uh, Professor said there, hardware is coming down in price, software is getting better, technology processing is getting better. So there are going to be answers. I, I don't know quite honestly what they are. We have a, a very open mind and interest in solving and, and working towards them. And uh, Maybe through this conversation, I hope to learn a little bit more about the, the things you guys have found out. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that's interesting to see, uh, Sandeep, is that uh, you know a lot of the diffusion of technology over the last uh, 50 years now, really, with the, the beginning of the smallpox eradication, really beginning with the Patents Act of 1970 in India, where you had now uh, India producing, reproducing many patented drugs uh, at that point because they changed the international law around what a patent was, not the ingredients, but the process. And so all of a sudden India was generating uh, billions of units of medications for antibiotics predominantly and vaccines at uh, you know, a, a 10th, a 20th of the cost that was originally coming out and really feeding the secondary markets around the globe. So that in, in effect really did lead to this transformation in medical technology. Now India is the, the home of most of the, uh, the Western world's IT development for uh, healthcare software. So we know today now that the diffusion of healthcare software has become much better and much more accessible because of that. And I think that's, that's where this intersection happens, right? So the AI models, and we can talk a little bit about that, uh, Asaf, as well. A lot of the AI models that are being developed today are actually being developed through data in the US and Western Europe and some other countries and being poured into a lot of the systems that are being created in India and being uh, run through India as well. But, you know, again, Asaf, from that standpoint, when you look at some of the machine learning uh, tools that are being developed and some of the algorithms that are being developed, uh, what is the role of these in healthcare? What are, what are some of the, the promises and what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the obstacles to this as we look to try to see these 
these models roll out to not just the uh, the highest resourced one billion, but also the lowest resourced one billion. So uh, first, I mean, I think that Sandeep made a great point about the fact that uh, it, I don't think that the Western uh, countries are showing, uh, you know, tremendous promise in how they're managing healthcare systems, right? We're not seeing exactly that there is some wondrous solution in the offing, except for the costs continuing to rise at the, the rate that they're rising from year to year. And at the same time, that's something that I, I don't want to touch upon, but I think that one of the things, again, that AI holds a promise for is, is access. So I, I mentioned the, for example, remote monitoring. Let me be a bit more concrete in an example, which is slightly more institutional as opposed to, to you know, quote unquote, consumer facing. So for example, even in a, a developed Western uh, healthcare infrastructure system like the US, there are, are large portions of the US that don't have uh, access to fully staffed ICUs and uh, intensive care units. And that's because it's extremely expensive and high touch. So, you know, ma major urban centers like the one that I'm in in New York, you have multiple hospitals that have very large ICUs with all the machinery, the human capital that's involved with that. But if you go to rural areas, there are large swaths of land that have basically no, um, no, either there is no real ICU, like fully functional ICU with all the capabilities, or there are ICUs in terms of infrastructure, but not manpower. Like you don't have, you can't fully staff the ICU, for example, which is sort of unheard of, right? So one of the solutions that, that have emerged in, in recent years are, are what's known as tele-ICUs. Uh, this means that you can actually remote manage ICUs. Uh, you have essentially the equivalent of a, of a, of a call center just uh, you know, highly paid, highly, highly skilled uh, staff, which are mostly physicians and nurse practitioners, et cetera, who monitor patients remotely through you know, screens that looks essentially like a control tower. Uh, and they can help in managing these uh, remote ICUs, which for which they're at various points in time, there is no um, acute care physician on deck. And the, the way to do that is the only reasonable way to do that is if you have supporting AI infrastructure, because you need to somehow prioritize care in a way that you don't really see the patient in front of you. So we have both uh, very sophisticated uh, visual uh, systems that basically acquire the patient's facial expressions and translate them. All the monitors and everything are connected to this funnel that feeds to this control tower. And this whole system basically operates with doctors being essentially not on deck, being remote. And that essentially uh, makes that level of, of care accessible to regions that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't have it. Uh, and I think this is just an example of something which is, uh, I think, the, the promise of these types of systems. Because with that supporting infrastructure, we can make these, uh, this type of care accessible. There are many, many pitfalls as well, Stan, you touched upon that in your question also. And I think part of that is, again, to develop these systems is very hard. In general healthcare, we're all uh, very idiosyncratic. Uh, and, uh, and the way our body behaves is very idiosyncratic. So developing sophisticated systems in this space is something which is, which is extremely challenging and requires a lot of um, very labor-intensive customization of AI tools. We can't just like, pluck algorithms off the shelf and and plug and play them. That's not gonna not gonna work. So there's a, an enormous amount of development in basically getting these systems to function the way that we'd like them to function. Yeah, I, I think you know the that, that addressing that and really you know this kind of addressing the idiosyncratic nature of uh, the human genome and human healthcare uh, and, and being able to develop personalized responses to uh, not just individual human healthcare globally for all people around the world, all 8 billion, but also being able to address the, the need for population uh, specific uh, addressment. And so we look at how the, uh, the pandemic has required better population health, not just in terms of collecting uh, biomedical data, uh, such as electronic health record data, epidemiologic data, but also some of the data that sits around us with biomedic, uh, bioinformatics data and genetic data uh, that is coming from the human body, uh, whether it's uh, saliva, tissue, skin, or whatnot. Uh, again, uh, just in incredible interview. Thank you both for joining today. Uh, and we wish you both the best in, in really helping not only develop and discover uh, and create these tools, uh, but also uh, fund them, uh, publish out on them, teach on them like you're, you're both doing. Thank you both for joining today. Thank you very much, Stan. And uh, nice, nice, nice to meet you also virtually.
Nice meeting you. Look forward to staying in touch. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And so uh, we have uh, just, again, a, uh, a great interview with two uh, people who are doing tremendous work in helping to, to develop and promote the, uh, uh, the execution, the implementation of digital in all countries around the world.